This is your reality check. Hi everyone, and welcome to The Reality Check, the weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. This is the show for November 26, 2019, and I am your host, Darren McKee. With me, as usual, are Adam Gardner. What's up, Woods? Christina Roach. Hey, everyone. And producer Pat. Hi, checkers. We have a great show for you today. I'm going to talk to you about donating effectively. And then Adam is going to explore the world of Marie Kondo and whether she sparks joy in all domains. <laughs> but first, is there a blue light lens mania going on, Christina? Well, tip of the hat to Darren for sending this one my way. CBC's Marketplace is one of my favorite investigative news shows, and we've cited it often on the cast. A couple of days ago, CBC, short for Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, published an article with the headline, Hidden Camera Investigation Reveals Scary and Misleading Sales Pitches to Sell Blue Light Lenses. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out we're spending way more time looking at digital screens. According to Market Watch's Quentin Fatral, who was reporting on a study by market research group Nielsen, U.S. adults spend more than, quote, 11 hours per day watching, reading, listening to, or simply interacting with media. This is up from four years ago, by the way, from about nine hours, 32 minutes. So I saw similar stats cited about Canadians, but I'd need to see other evidence because that survey was commissioned by Alcon, and they promote a lens that filters blue light, and this is all about blue light claims. So just saying. Don't be a fool, be skeptical. <laughs> Sometimes I think it's fun to throw a, an Elon thing out there to just, you know, test the water, see if he's still listening to the show. Now back to CBC Marketplace. The bottom line is that big optical chains in Canada like Hakeem Optical, Lens Crafters, Vogue, and HBC are making bogus claims that blue light lenses can help keep serious eye diseases at bay. This is a problem because they are selling lenses they claim protect our eyes from the blue light emitted from our digital screens. Noteworthy that people seem to be eating this up. Filtering lenses account for $18 million U.S. in global sales this year. Wow. But wait, don't experts claim that digital blue light isn't harmful? Yes, yes, they do. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any scientific evidence that blue light is harmful according to experts. And when I say experts, I'm talking in the field of optometry and ophthalmology. So real experts. More from them shortly. Now, Marketplace went shopping with a hidden camera and came across several sales reps making some pretty misleading health claims about blue light. These claims include blue light lenses help prevent digital eye strain. That one's pretty mild. Digital screens can damage your retinas. Hmm. <laughs> We're getting really questionable here. Lead to serious eye diseases and unbelievably increase the risk of cancer. Mm. Two opticians at Hudson's Bay Optical actually suggested this because of a pamphlet from the lens manufacturer Vision Ease. Vogue Optical made the same claims on their site. If that's not the icing on the cake, guys, one optician was quoted as saying, blue light has very sharp rays penetrating at the back of the eyes. <laughs> And a separate salesperson said, quote, it tears the eyes right out of you. Darren, can you please do a pirate impression of that line for my amusement? Yar, it tears the eyes right out of you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the reality check. A spokesperson for the American Academy of Ophthalmology named Dr. Raul Corona told CBC that the notion of blue light blocking is flawed on so many levels. He says blue light fear... Paranoia is really out there, but there's no evidence to show it's truly dangerous, and blocking it has not ever been shown to have any benefits. Macular specialist Dr. Sunir Garg, an ophthalmologist and American Academy of Ophthalmology spokesperson, expressed his concern with how misleading the salespeople were being. Yes, retinal damage and macular degeneration is serious, but the blue light from your screen has nothing to do with it. He continues to say, I can't fault them because I'm sure they're getting a little info sheet that says here's three talking points about blue light blocking lenses, but it's not based on scientific data. 
Philip Juhas, who is an assistant prof of optometry at Ohio State, says studies show, quote, people blink far less during computer use and that blue light filters have not shown any improved visual comfort for digital eye strain. Dr. John O'Hagan, an optical radiation expert who conducted a public health England study, concluded light levels from digital devices are not harmful. And even if you stared at your device all day, the amount of blue light emitted is less than 1% of the safe exposure level. And, quote, considerably below the levels that we experience outside even in winter. I was about to say, so what if I'm looking at my phone in front of a blue sky? (laughs) Does that make it 1% extra worse? What if you're looking at five phones, yeah, at the same time, standing on one leg? I don't know. Now, Hudson's Bay claims it got the wrong info and that it would pull all Vision E's marketing materials from all stores stat. Vision E's, however, digging their heels in, saying they stand by their marketing materials And that more studies are needed because, you know, the science around blue light is conflicting and ambiguous. Isn't that rich? If more studies are needed, then why staunchly make unproven claims? Now, other chains had similar mamby-pamby statements like, well, optical science evolves quickly and insisting there is some evidence supporting harm from blue light somewhere. I tell you, checkers, ending on a positive note, thanks to Marketplace's stellar reporting, Health Canada is stepping in. Prescription lenses are regulated through the Medical Devices Regulations and the Food and Drugs Act, which prohibits false, misleading, or deceptive advertising of a medical device, such as the promotion of claims without safety and effectiveness data. So, Health Canada says it's going to follow up on anyone making unsupported health claims in their advertising. A fun footnote. The UK does not allow opticians to make any unproven claims about blue light like the ones reported by CBC, and retailers risk hefty fines if they do. I think I read in one case it was 400,000 pounds. We could take a page, I guess. Now, I also wanted to make a distinction between claims around damage from blue light and the effects of blue light on our sleep. Simply put, blue light is said to make us more alert. There's evidence to support this. So the American Academy of Ophthalmology does recommend either using a blue light filter on your device or disconnect completely a couple of hours before you head to bed. Yeah, I think a lot of devices have a sort of night mode that will uh, have less blue light to to sort of offset that, right? Yeah. I use it on my phone. Mm -hmm. I thought that would be a future segment. Great segment, Christina. I think this is really important to cover such things, as if there aren't enough real problems. We have to come up with fake problems for people to be concerned about. Uh, Uh, Also, I think you said the phrase mamby-pamby, and it's actually (laughs) mamby-pamby. Thank you, Darren. With Giving Tuesday happening on December 3rd, tis that time again for what is becoming a yearly segment, me talking to you about how to give to effective charities. To be fair, though, previous segments were called Effective Donating, and this segment is called Donating Effectively. (laughs) So obviously it's completely different. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That said, I don't just want to repeat the past couple years, so I'll do a quick summary of some of the key ideas about making effective charitable donations and spend a bit more time on describing the charity evaluation website GiveWell, givewell givewell.org, and then explore whether and why one should give it all. But first, Giving Tuesday was started in 2012 by the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan and some other organizations as a response of sorts to Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Many people are joyous about acquiring cheap electronics and other goods, but what if the focus was about helping others for a day? I know, weird. So you'll see Giving Tuesday on social media coming up on December 3rd, and feel free to embrace the social movement and solidarity and give back. But how to make an effective donation? Well, here's a quick rundown of some of the more detail that I provided on episodes 526 or 477. Number one, focus on effectiveness, not just on the overhead of an organization. Number two, focus on a couple or even just one charity instead of splitting donations amongst many charities. It increases administrative burden and reduces efficiency. Uh, Number three, if you're donating to a large organization like Oxfam or the Red Cross, don't restrict your donation to a particular cause or region. It just inhibits them from allocating resources effectively. If you're trusting them in the first place, they know what the needs are. Mm -hmm. Number four, 
set up a recurring monthly donation, credit card or bank withdrawal, as, you know, we know we're all human here, wink, wink, and sometimes we fail to achieve our goals, whether it be exercise or spending less time on social media, so we can leverage structures to help us do so. Mm -hmm. Number five, get a tax receipt. This way, you can donate more. Some people think it's more generous to not get a receipt, Mm -hmm. but with a receipt, you'll get some money back and you could donate that. So don't fall into the emotional trap that leads to bad thinking. I have to say, Darren, that's one thing that you've said in the past that really, really stuck with me. Great. And number six, the most important of all, choose a good charity. This links to the first point, but it's worth discussing in more detail. Now, many people are swayed by advertising or some personal association at work or on the street when someone asks you for money. But what if you really prioritized effectiveness? How would one do such a thing? Where would you start? There's about 86,000 charities in Canada and about a million in the United States. So your random chance of picking a really good one is not high. (laughs) And if you just come into contact with a charity through some friend or another, who knows what their selection criteria are? Fortunately, other people have thought about this a lot, and they created the organization GiveWell and the related website GiveWell.org. You can find the link in the show notes, or you can type it into Google. (laughs) (laughs) GiveWell.org. It was started by two hedge fund guys over a decade ago who wanted to donate effectively, but were having trouble finding reliable data on whether various charities actually had the impact they said they did. Mm. They were sort of applying the financial and scientific rigor one might use before investing in a company or a technology, but to charity and development. Many charities, at least 10 years ago, like, we do this, this is our program, we give out this much money, or we do this thing, which is implied that it does some good. But it's not enough just to say you did the thing. Like, what was the impact? Did you have a randomized control trial? How do you know it wouldn't have happened anyway? These sorts of things. Over many years, the GiveWell has focused on charities that are most likely to do something good with your donation. The main goal is to do good or reduce suffering. Now, there are long philosophical discussions about how these are not exactly the same thing, but I think for the average person they are, so we'll just stick with that for today. Mm. Before I discuss the pros and cons of GiveWell's approach, I want to mention two main pillars underlying the edifice. Equality. Basically, everyone on Earth is counted equally. Now, everyone, some sort of personhood, some sort of sentience, but generally speaking, all lives are counted equally. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm well aware that if there's a physical distance, like a geographical distance, that leads to a psychological distance, and that leads to a moral distance. Yeah. But that's not actually true. That's just an unfortunate quirk of our human psychology, or fortunate in some domains, but unfortunate in other domains. So if you actually believe people are equal, well then, lives in other countries count just as much as lives in your own country. Also, cause neutrality, or strategic cause prioritization, it's not the cause itself that matters. That's just a proxy for reducing suffering. For example, cancer sure is terrible. Of course it is. But what you care about is someone suffering from cancer. It's the suffering that matters, not the cancer in and of itself. So cancer is important, but why is it important? To reduce the suffering. So why not just focus on reducing suffering? And therefore, it doesn't necessarily have to be cancer. It's just whatever can reduce the suffering the most. Mm -hmm. And if there's so much suffering, it makes sense to focus on what can do the most good. Givel has a recommendation of top charities linked in the show notes, and you'll notice they seem to involve reducing malaria or intestinal worms or cash transfers. And that links to my above point. I happen to donate money to buy anti-malarial bed nets for people in different countries, and it's not that I care about malaria that much. It's that reducing the risk of people getting malaria seems to be one of the best giving opportunities. If it turned out it was something else, then it would be something else. It's not the malaria itself, it's the reducing of suffering. Now I'm going to quote GiveWell's website, uh, where they say here are the main advantages of their recommendations. Quote, they represent the best opportunities we're aware of to help low-income people with relatively high confidence and relatively short time horizons. If you're looking to give this year and you don't know where to start, we strongly recommend supporting our top charities. Further, due to the emphasis on thorough vetting, transparency, and following up, our top charities represent excellent learning opportunities, and we feel that one of the most desirable outcomes of giving is learning more that will inform later giving. Supporting our top charities helps GiveWell demonstrate impact and improves our ability to learn, and we are dedicated to sharing what we learn publicly. GiveWell is highly, highly transparent. They tell you about meetings that they've had. You can listen to recorded phone calls. You can actually hear their and read about their thinking about why they chose one thing or another. So there's often like internal discussions or debates that companies might have, and they don't share that information publicly. GiveWell tends to. They even have a list of the people who work for GiveWell and whether they actually do or do not donate to the charities that GiveWell recommends. Interesting. And they provide their reasons. (laughs) So it's not at all the, like, we all support this, therefore everyone who works for us is also supporting it. Not that way at all. Everyone can be independent to as much as they like. But there are some disadvantages, and here's quoting GiveWell again. 
We have strict criteria about what sort of charities we recommend. These criteria are partly about achieving maximum impact, but partly about having recommendations that others can fairly easily be confident in. As well, they say, quote, Seeking strong evidence and a straightforward documented case for impact can be in tension with maximizing impact, as argued, and I'd love to post a link from the Open Philanthropy Project, which was incubated at GiveWell. In general, the Open Philanthropy Project focuses on higher risk, high reward returns, while the GiveWell recommendations are as much reliability and certainty as you may have to help someone, as I said, within a relatively short time horizon. As we know, these things aren't usually together. You're like, well, what's the biggest impact possible with the most reliability? That's not usually how the world works. <laughs> <laughs> so GiveWell says that they think there may be many giving opportunities that are better than their top charities, but they actually don't meet the criteria or they're not known to us. Okay. So that's, I think, an important point, which seems obvious, but I think it's important they admit it. There may be something better out there, but we just don't know what it is. Yeah. Now, it's not to say they haven't looked, because they have, but they're trying to acknowledge the nature of uncertainty in the world. Interesting. And they also say, even though we believe our top charities are backed by strong evidence, none of the recommendations are a sure thing. And actually, some of them have a risk of not doing much good. Hmm. Now, that's true, but I think they're more of a sure thing than any other charity I've ever come across. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, I think it's a relative scale here yeah. where the Givel charity seems far more likely to do what it says it's going to do than some other organizations. Sure. I mentioned before the Open Philanthropy Project often focuses on high risk, high reward. And that's fine. If that's what you want to do, my suggestion would be just to do so consciously. Don't just sort of go haphazardly go about your giving and then maybe retrospectively, after the fact, try to justify why you're doing it. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm giving to a charity that may not be effective, but you know what? It's because I value high risk, high reward giving. Like, well, maybe <laughs> maybe your charity is just not that rigorous and effective. Yeah. There are opportunities to explore here. In general, logical, transparent, evidence-based, these are the things that I'm suggesting we value. And this is how GiveWell operates and is exactly what you'd want if you're trying to maximize doing good and not just the warm, fuzzy feeling that you might get from helping people. Fuzzy feeling's important. Sometimes without it, you can't do anything. So try to know yourself of how much you need the fuzzy feeling versus something else. But realize that the fuzzy feeling is not itself the doing of good. Yeah. So why give at all? Now, I've not come across an argument that is completely convincing. Otherwise, you would have heard it and you would be giving more. That's how the world works. <laughs> But the arguments people use to not give more are often easily addressed. First, some people say they have no money. Well, this is clearly the case. If you don't have any money, you should not be donating to charity. Don't go into debt to help people. That's straightforward. If that's the message you're hearing, this is not necessarily aimed at you if you do not have the resources. You have to take care of your basic needs and perhaps your loved ones, right? People often say charity begins at home. You should help people closer to you in your community, Okay, but that goes to the, well, what is your notion of equality? If you actually think people in your local municipality, province, state are worth more than other people, you can have that belief. I don't think you really want to say it out loud. It sounds a bit odd. And that's how people often act. But it is still the case that it just doesn't make sense. It may sound a bit odd, but there's probably like a hundred ways that people could phrase it to make it not sound odd. I know. People do say that almost. Oh, they certainly do. Also, you could say if it's charity begins at home, it doesn't mean I have to end there. There's a nice flip for you. Interesting. There's also something called the argument from futility, and this is the idea that because you can't help everyone, you won't help anyone. And when I phrase it like that, you're like, well, that seems silly. It's like, <laughs> it's like, well, I can't do everything, so I won't do anything. It's just a terrible way of thinking. You can't exercise an hour a day, I won't exercise at all, forever. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. But being human, we do feel overwhelmed, and when you read about all the suffering, or you just try to onboard how many people are suffering each day from all these different maladies, it can seem overwhelming and it won't matter. But it does yeah, matter. Humans can be very all or nothing. Otherwise. Exactly. Yeah. And it just just sort of rephrasing is like, well, wait, is it better to do something rather than nothing? And to be fair, sometimes it isn't. But if you can find reliable charities, it is actually better to do something. And sort of in your own life or your own family, if someone's sick and you kind of want to help them, maybe you can't entirely solve their problem, but it doesn't mean you can't do something. Yeah. And people naturally very much do this. If a friend of yours, say, does have cancer, you don't think, well, I can't cure the cancer. I won't help them at all. You bring them some food. You try to get them something. It's this natural human tendency. So just try to shift that thinking to the broader global perspective. And trying to have a bit more of an optimistic note, it's never been easier to help people. As much as I said there's a lot of suffering in the world, which there is, things are getting a bit better. See Stephen Pinker. And things could even be better because many times they're still awful. But with that in mind... If you're saddened by the state of the world, you should probably stop reading mainstream news, <laughs> unless you're following many of them at the same time and following them in depth, and realize that things are getting better in various domains, and you can help people. You don't physically have to go on the ground in a different country and actually do anything. You can just click a few buttons on the internet, 
and someone else will do it for you. <laughs> like it really is, if you think in the history of the world, how easy it is to make a significant impact in the lives of others, it's incredible. It's amazing. Yeah. Something to reflect on is a question, what else could be more meaningful than reducing suffering? Hmm. Darren, one of the six points you made, I think, was uh, sign up for a monthly donation. Mm-hmm. Yes. But we've talked about this previously, or you've talked about this previously, and you've talked about transaction costs. So wouldn't annual donation make more sense because of the transaction costs? Or is it simply that by signing up to do it monthly, you're more likely to stick with it? Great clarification, Pat. I personally don't do a monthly thing. I do an annual lump sum that may or may not be good for other people. One is that can you trust yourself to make a lump sum at a certain point each year? Secondly, for different charities, if it's a monthly donation, they can then better allocate the resources because it's like, oh, this money's going to come in each month. Mm-hmm. And the lump sum, unless it's a very large organization, depending on the size of it, it might just not throw things off, but they may not be able to anticipate it as well as if they could if it was a monthly thing. Mm-hmm. But you're right. Every time there's a monthly transaction, it might sort of add up. And for larger sums, like what I might try to donate, I'll usually send them a check because that's much cheaper than, say, credit card. But it really sort of fits to the individual's preference of how they might go about things. Some people I know, they actually think, oh, that monthly donation is the most important thing I do that month. And they get to think about like, oh, every month I'm doing this thing. I'm the person who does something good every month. And I thought about that. Maybe I should switch to monthly just because like, okay, I did this this month. It's really just different ways of thinking about it to try to make yourself understand the impact you're actually having. And that's the quirky thing about this, that I could buy bed nets for an entire village. And I have compared to friend of the show, Jim Davies, who told me a story that he was walking home in some old shoes and he saw some guy uh, who was homeless who needed shoes. And he asked him if he wanted his shoes. So Jim gave the homeless guy his shoes and then he walked the rest of the way barefoot. So in this context, one guy who I don't know got shoes. I didn't do it. I heard about it from a friend of mine and that makes me feel good. Actually, it might make me feel better than helping an entire village not get malaria. (laughs) And that's because my brain is a stupid monkey brain. (laughs) And we value logic on the show. So I have to consciously tell myself, of course, stopping or trying to reduce the likelihood of all these people getting malaria is more important than this one pair of shoes while at the same time observing the effect it has on me. Yeah, but one little visit to that village and you'd you'd feel differently, right? You'd see how maybe or maybe not. That is. Well, I would hope so because then there might be more of a personal connection, and that is yeah. one of the tricky things with donating exactly. overseas. That's, that's my point, Pat. Personal at the, connection. At the same time, in this particular example, what I'm trying to do is almost like create the non-existence of malaria, mm-hmm. right? So it's not yeah. that I'm helping a particular problem; I'm reducing the likelihood of the problem ever happening. It's sort of like, in a way, the bad understanding of how vaccines work. They've mm-hmm. been so successful, people don't realize we need them. Yeah. And so you're like, look at all the non-suffering from vaccines. It's uh, understanding non-events is also very tricky for humans. And against malaria actually tries to do a good job. We bought this many nets Mm -hmm. for this place on this date. Yes, you're correct, Pat. The Against Malaria Foundation, which is the one we're talking about, does uh, allow you to track your donation, where they talk about where the nets might have been bought, the time, and then what country they're going to be deployed in and how many people will be affected, which is very useful. And there's no doubt that's very helpful. Mm-hmm. Again, it's just, we have to admit, it does require a bit more cognitive work. And of course, that's often what the right thing to do requires. <laughs> and speaking of stupid monkey brains, I mean, it, it's funny how the nuance makes a difference. You can say you've decreased the malaria, whatever, by this much. But if you say your donation has affected this many people, that seems more emotionally impactful to me. Which we saw a lot in the, I guess, the 80s and the 90s when it was like you're donating to a village, but you actually are sponsoring a child and you got a picture of that yes. child and they wrote yeah. you a letter. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is, it is tricky to do the on average i've saved several lives this year like well okay that doesn't that's not quite the same as knowing you have but the stats do bear it out and what could be more meaningful i was just saying there's a time to be charitable and perhaps a time to be less charitable when the person doesn't deserve it adam What's up with Marie Kondo lately? Good question, Darren. Marie Kondo is an organizing consultant best known for her successful book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, and her Netflix series, Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. More recently, she's opened an online shop with sells, well, pseudoscientific crap, and we'll get to that a bit later. Full confession. 
I have not read her book. I have never watched her show. This whole movement has irked me from the first time I heard about it. I'm all for tidying up and getting rid of junk. But the mystical slant to this whole thing has really put me off. I'm wondering, am I imagining this sort of pseudoscientific mystical slant? Well, just from her Wikipedia page, she describes an important moment in childhood where she passed out and heard a voice, like a god of tidying, telling her to look more closely at her way of tidying. She says that her method is partly inspired by the Shinto religion and that cleaning and organizing can be a spiritual practice in Shintoism which is concerned with the energy of the divine spirit of things and the right way to live. Oh boy. The title of her book literally refers to tidying up as life-changing magic. Now, I was happy to stumble upon an article earlier this year titled, Tidying Up is Not Joyful, But Another Misuse of Eastern Ideas. The author compares Marie Kondo to a sort of Mr. Miyagi for cleaning. And this quote of the article really brings it home to me. The process by which mundane activities transmute into improved well-being is mysterious, but the mystery is much of the allure. Folding clothes as an organizational strategy is boring, but folding clothes as a mystical infused plan of life is alluring. It's not about the clothes, it's about everything all at once. The author Amy Olberding is a scholar of East Asian philosophies. She speaks of how popular East Asian philosophies take small wisdom and make it all the wisdom. Now, this has people using Sun Tzu's The Art of War to guide their retirement savings or help coach a football team, which was never really the idea. <laughs> that is delightful. Yeah. As Sun Tzu said, I should invest in this ETF. <laughs> Amazing. So Marie Kondo's tidying is similarly applied to other things that aren't just tidying. On her website, she has an article in the KonMari philosophy section titled, What to Do When a Relationship No Longer Sparks Joy. So basically, she's talking about doing with people uh, what you do uh, with an old shirt you don't want anymore. So you're applying the tidy tidying principle to things that aren't tidying. So this touches on that idea about it's about all things. Now, Amy Olberding asks readers to imagine an American equivalent to Marie Kondo, a tired maid who spent her life cleaning and had to move into a trailer. This would be a less appealing equivalent of the now trendy tiny home movement, telling people to get rid of what they don't need. Now, it's the same advice, and it's good advice, but I don't imagine her book or Netflix series would have done quite as well. Now, through my life, I've learned the advantages of ridding myself of things as well. Following my divorce and through various moves, I often got myself in a mood where I felt happy to rid myself of things that I had no need for. And I've often been described as a hoarder in the past, but I can see the value of owning less stuff. Taking stock of your possessions, discarding anything you're unlikely to make use of is quite useful to keep your home clean and just useful in general. All that junk sort of weighs down on you in a mental way. A mental way, I mean, that is consistent with a human mind, which is the product of evolution by natural selection, not some mystical soul and some other way of weighing down on you. I never had Marie Kondo come into my home and tell me to thank anything, but I've had a couple of real estate agents tell me to get rid of a lot of stuff if I wanted to make my home appealing. So anyone who's sold a house knows how much nicer things look when there's just a lot less of everything around, and anyone who's visited a home that wasn't cleaned in that way knows how terrible it looks when it's not. So practically speaking, I still have a good deal of stuff, but I like to keep most of it out of the main living areas, which are my living room, kitchen, and bedroom. So this is this is what works for me in keeping things looking nice while still, you know, having some of the things that bring me some joy. Now, of course, I have children, so this is a constant struggle to try to keep things looking okay. But the real estate agents of the world do not speak of ancient Asian wisdom. They speak from a place of practical capitalism. Now, they don't have a Netflix special, but they have a lot of reality TV shows, which are quite popular, although perhaps not with the same crowd as the people who like Marie Kondo. Now, when deciding what to keep and what to discard, be practical about it. Consider your own feelings on it, but don't let Marie Kondo's intuition is always right fool you. Your feelings and intuitions are very good at persuading you to do things which are not in your best interest, so try to think of things a little more objectively. So tidying up is good. It can potentially make concrete improvements to a person's mental well-being. I don't consider it spiritual, since I don't consider anything to be spiritual, because I'm an atheist and I don't think statements like spiritual but not religious make any sense at all. Now, I do not consider it to be magic, because... Magic does not exist, and I don't think it's good for the soul because I also think souls do not exist. But there's more. Marie Kondo has opened up a shop, Con Marie, which sells a lot of goods. 
and there's a lot of BS in there. A popular item is a tuning fork and crystal. There are a few varieties of crystal you can buy just the fork. From the description, Marie uses a tuning fork in her everyday life to help her reset. Striking the fork against a crystal creates pure tones that are believed to help restore a sense of balance. This has a frequency of 4096 hertz. As a computer engineer who works in IT, I do appreciate the powers of two, but I don't know that that makes a big difference. Now, I don't appreciate the $70 price tag, but what do I know about quartz crystals, what they're worth, and tuning forks and things like that? Now, this is not something which Marie Kondo created, and there are a lot of other people who believe that tones have some spiritual power, because you can find a similar tone on YouTube if you really want that, but it's probably not going to do anything for you. Now, another item in the store is the Binchoten Charcoal. And I quote from the product description, For centuries, artisans in Japan's Kishu region have been burning Ubame oak branches to yield binchotan, charcoal renowned for its purifying properties. These sticks can be used to filter water, bring out flavor while cooking rice, absorb odors in rooms and refrigerators, or give a healthy boost to soil and gardens or potted plants. Now, I'm not sure how these are used, but I so I can't comment on whether or not this would really work, but... Um, sure, there are charcoal filters, and burnt wood can make soil s- somewhat more fertile, so it's not 100% nonsense, but I think it's safe to say that this burnt wood from Japan's Kishu region is functionally similar to burnt wood from the park down the street or any old charcoal. So uh, at $18, it's not really that expensive, but it's a little silly. Adam, it really sounds like she's loaning her name yeah. to existing products. Absolutely. So yeah. she's a lot, she does sell her books in the store. So some of the stuff in the store is her products, but a lot of these are not her products. She's just sort of curated a list of products that she's selling in her store. Um, and some of them kind of fit with the Japanese um, aesthetic. Also, in general, uh, if you're putting charcoal in soil, that's one thing, but don't put it in your food. I mean, the charcoal on the grill is delicious, but it's not actually good for you. Yeah, you shouldn't be ingesting it, right? Now, there's an entire section on aromatherapy, which is largely nonsense. If your goal from aromatherapy is to get a nice smell, there's nothing wrong with it. But these things often come with unproven health claims or unproven claims in general. I talked about doTERRA essential oils on the show. That was a more specific segment, but the idea is still there. These just don't do what they say they do. For example, um, the essential oil bundle rapid fires these claims about what smells will do to your mental and physical state. Calming lavender, invigorating eucalyptus, refreshing spruce, and energizing grapefruit. And there are quite a few sprays from Paper Crane Apothecary. The Lucky Stars Abundance Mist is infused with gemstones and is formulated to attract abundance with each spray. So I guess you get rich just by spraying that in your house. There's the Now or Never Motivation Mist, which is formulated to enhance motivation by promoting feelings of determination and capability with every spray. Oh, this is brutal. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, my favorite, the Everlasting Love Romance Mist. It's formulated to enhance romance by promoting feelings of love and acceptance with each spray. Now, I'm sure this doesn't actually do this, but it is essentially billed as a love potion. And can you imagine the ethical concerns of using such a product if it actually did work? Now, there's also a shiatsu stick, a stick from the Kochi Prefecture of Japan. And I quote, to enhance the ancient practice of shiatsu, in which pressure is applied to certain areas of the body to help relieve tension. Now, again, we could do a whole show on shiatsu, but there is no scientific evidence that shiatsu massage has any medicinal benefits. A soap is billed as Daily Detox, which on its own is questionable. It's claimed to have a blend of rejuvenating juniper berry, stimulating lemongrass, and purifying charcoal. So there's three dubious health claims in one. So it's a real mixed bag of unrelated pseudoscience. Um, So like I said, she doesn't make these products. She's sort of curating the store to sell all these other products. But most of the products in the store aren't really sort of medical or making these kind of wild claims. They're just harmless decorations, just Japanese-looking things to make your home look a little tidy, hide cables or whatever. So a lot of those don't claim to have any magical, unproven effect. Some people think this is in itself um, sort of hypocritical because Marie Kondo makes people get rid of stuff, and they say she made people get rid of stuff only to fill their homes with all this stuff she's I was just about to say. (laughs) Yeah, um, I, I... I don't know if that's totally an accurate portrayal of what's going on here because I haven't read the book, but my understanding is it's not about getting rid of stuff, but it's getting rid of the stuff you don't need and keeping and cherishing the stuff that you do like that does bring beauty and joy and whatever into your life. 
Tidying up is undeniably a good thing. Getting rid of stuff which you don't need is also generally a smart thing to do, which will bring emotional benefits which are consistent with a naturalistic worldview. Marie Kondo is not an evidence-based person. Though her advice on cleaning may occasionally overlap with actual useful advice, it is also peppered with nonsense, magical language, and vague spiritual claims which audiences clearly find very appealing. Her online store is filled with nonsense, making unproven claims, which makes it sort of like an Asian goop. Marie Kondo does not spark joy in me, and so I have no place in my life for her. I will not thank her for what she has taught me, because that is stupid. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for joining us once again, listeners. Christina talked to us about the blue light mania that's going on. And yes, blue light might disturb your sleep, but it's not going to hurt your eyes. Don't fall for those false claims. Mm -hmm. I talked to you about donating effectively and how there's many different ways to increase the impact of your donation. Recommended you look at the GiveWell website and think about why and how you can give. And finally, Adam looked into Marie Kondo's newest venture, and she really puts the con in Kondo. <laughs> Until next time, think better to act better. Peace out, cute boys. Stay classy, not smart assy. We'll talk to you soon, Jackers. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TRC underscore podcast. Now, macular specialist, Dr. Sunir Garg, an optomal, an optom, <laughs> I knew I was going to have trouble. <laughs> macular specialist, Dr. Sunir Garg, an optomal, oh my God. Wait, wait, so I, think, I said it before. I think, I think the first Optima H doesn't need to be there. Oh, you're but, right. You know. I, you know what? That's right. It's because it's spelled wrong. <laughs> Yo, yo, the thing is, I got my advice from an ophthalmologist over here. From my here. ophthalmologist over here. I get my beer here. advice from a hophthalmologist. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I got my Labad blue light. Yeah, I got it. <clears throat> I got my cleaning advice from a mophthalmologist. <laughs> <laughs> this is the rest of the show now. <laughs> Macular specialist, Dr. Sunir. Off of the pop <laughs> 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 <laughs>